I walked off of the floor of the Hearns Center where the University of Missouri basketball team played. Over in the corner there was an archway of sorts that looked like it led to a tunnel. Once I got through that archway, I walked up a couple of flights of stairs and sat down, exhausted, sweating, hurting, and in tears. I had just wrestled the last match of my wrestling career at the Missouri State High School Tournament, and as I climbed those stairs, right behind me was Coach Beard, the very same coach that welcomed me to the wrestling room my freshman year when I got cut from the basketball team. And as I sat there with him quietly, on the end of that bookended journey with him, we could hear all of the noise from out in the arena. Because wrestling matches are noisy affairs. Even if you just have two teams and one mat with two people wrestling, everyone is screaming because people start to learn the names of the moves and when you should use them. So there's the half and out and if it's appropriate, people start yelling, half, or wizard, or crossface. Some of them just yell, get up, or take it down. Lots of screaming and yelling. And all of those voices, it's parent. You should have seen my mom. No one would sit by her. She would wing around and screaming and yelling. And your teammates are screaming and yelling. And half the people are telling you what to do. And half the people are telling the other person what to do. And there are all these voices. Well, at that state tournament, there were probably 8, 10, 12 mats set up. And a whole arena full of people screaming. And amidst all of those voices, it just becomes a lot that you have to listen to. As we enter into this Palm Sunday Gospel, we will hear that there are quite a few different voices. Voices that still speak to us this day. Voices maybe that we speak. And as we hear them, the first of those voices is the voice of the crowd. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, he stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began even to displace. The crowd, the assembly, we might even, as the story goes on, begin to call this a mob, bring Jesus before Pilate. As we see this mob bring Jesus before Pilate, it becomes a question of justice. Now, at a basic level, we may think of justice as what happens in court where those who have disagreements come to some fair, equitable arrangements. We may think of it as punishing criminals, but at a much deeper level, justice is about each human being being valued for who they are, having opportunity, being loved and cared for, and having the grace to live in this world. And as Jesus enters into this conversation with Pilate, it is justice really on all of those levels. And the mob has something to say, and what the mob wants is death. Because that's what mobs do. When you stir up mobs, they are not thoughtful groups of people. They go seeking supposedly justice. Think of the dark history in our country of lynch mobs. Lynch mobs were groups of white people who had some perceived or real wrong perpetrated against them by a black person in the community. And the mob would get stirred up to go get justice. Not with judges, not with juries, but finding someone, not always the person that was supposedly guilty, and hanging them on a tree. Mobs are not very right. They seek rough justice. And we still have the voice of the mob with us all the time. Sometimes it's subtle. There are groups of high school girls where they will get stirred up against one of their number and begin to ostracize her and push her out. That's a mob. It's a mob mentality. But we also have voices in our culture that would stir us up, stir us up for revenge, stir us up for violence, stir us up to fight and seek justice in a way that often ends with blood and death, just as it will for Jesus. So the voice of the mob starts us off on this journey, but then Pilate gets to a point of seeing that there really is nothing that he can see that Jesus has done, so he hands him off to Herod, and there we get the voice of destruction. 
asked whether the man was a Galilean. And we, when he had learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priest and the scribes stood by, venomously accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then they put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. There are parts of the Gospel where we get a sense that Herod is threatened by Jesus. This is not one of them. As Jesus shows up to Herod, we are told that he was hoping Jesus would do some sign of power. Herod wants to be entertained. After he spent some time with Jesus, they decide to put an elegant robe on him. They're, they're really teasing him, taunting him, dressing him up to dance him around to entertain themselves. This is the voice of distraction. We live in a culture that is constantly being drawn into distraction. The whole idea of reality TV is about putting something in front of us that will entertain us, and then it has to kind of amp up how shocking or different or interesting it is to keep us engaged. And this short attention span that we have doesn't just linger in entertainment. It's impacted the church. It's impacted all measures of our culture to where distraction is what we seek so often. And particularly when it comes to justice, if you know the person in front of you is really innocent, but you need to somehow condemn them, you have to distract people from that. So Herod distracts them, dresses them up, dances them around, enters into this way of this voice of distraction. Now we hear that voice. It's easy to be distracted in our culture. If you want to waste an entire day sitting on Facebook or digging into social media, those hours could just go by quickly. And distraction is nice, though, because it keeps us from having to dwell in the pain and the struggle of life sometimes. To sit in those places where injustice may be in front of us. To sit with our own pain and struggle. And so those voices of distraction that draw our attention away are so easy to follow. And as Herod seeks to distract them, he also has no condemnation to bring, really. So he sends him back to Pilate. And as Jesus goes to Pilate, he encounters a voice of distance indifference. Pilate, <clears throat> Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is perverting the, the people, and here I have examined him in your presence, and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him, neither has Herod, for he has sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and released him. And they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow, release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been, take, been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate wanted to release Jesus, addressing them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that, that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they had wished. Pilate was no angel that was averse to violence. If he thought Jesus was a threat, he would have killed him without thought. And indeed, his solution with this person that he sees as innocent is to flog him before sending him out. For some reason, Pilate doesn't want to get too close to this particular death. He begins to distance himself from it by offering the crowd alternatives, by pushing Jesus' death further away from himself. I really believe he's indifferent to what happens to Jesus. If Jesus isn't a threat to him, it doesn't matter. And so he begins to set up this voice of distanced indifference, which we frequently have around us. Many of us have opportunities when we're out in the world to help other people that are struggling or in pain. And often we hear that voice that says, don't get involved, it's none of your business, stay away from there, you don't have time, this is not your fight to fight. 
And in that way, we can start to distance ourselves from other people's sort of day-to-day -day struggles that we see. But justice is a much deeper level is about the systems in which we live. Racism is alive and well in our country. So is sexism and lots of other isms. And every time racism or sexism or other isms rear their heads, people suffer because of that. Now it's easy for relatively comfortable middle class white people to not see those struggles. It's easy for us to start to distance ourselves from them and even to be indifferent from them. So that when cries for justice come out, we can say, well, I am not a racist, or I am not sexist, or I am not prejudiced against that particular group of people. But as soon as we say that, we have started to distance ourselves from the ways that the systems benefit us, the way that the systems go around us and cause injustice that we don't necessarily see or pay attention to. And so we live with this distanced indifference that puts a distance between us and those who live every day with injustice in their lives. And as we sit in that place then, another voice comes into this story, and that is the voice of mocking. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breast and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that will never bore, and the breasts that will never nurse. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this, when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by, watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sen sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong, and he said, Jesus, remember, remember me when you, when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus has been tortured, beaten, and hung on a cross to die a very painful death. All of that is plenty bad enough, but then they have to mock him on top of it, to call him names, to tease him, to taunt him. Anyone who lives with injustice in our culture already is living in a difficult place. Being poor is stressful. If you're poor, you wonder where your food's going to come from, where you're going to sleep the next day, how you're going to get by. And then on top of that come the names that we throw at people. Poor people are lazy. Poor people don't do this. Poor people should get a job. Poor people this. Poor people that. Knocking on top of the stress of living in that difficult place. And when you look at any of those isms, whether it's racism, sexism, and then the mocking comes, how often have we seen women who stand up for women's rights get called names and mocked and taunted? It happens all the time. It is a, a loud voice that we hear, and it's not just a voice we hear that sometimes is directed at us. Often it's a voice that we participate in. And so on top of the injustice comes the mocking and the taunting. And as we head into the last stretch of this story, we hear a quiet voice of truth. It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light faded and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, 
Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breast. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. As the voice of the mob gets ever louder, as the voice of distraction, the voice of distance, indifference, the voice of mocking are all there, there are two quiet voices of truth. The one we just heard was the second one, the centurion saying, surely this guy was innocent. The first one came with the other prisoner hanging there who said, stop making fun of him. He is the king and the Lord taking with you to paradise. Out of all of the religious leaders, all of the mob, the voices they would not listen to would have been a prisoner and a centurion. And yet, those two unlikely voices are the one that speak these quiet words of truth. Words about truth, of injustice in our culture, are spoken all the time. They sometimes come from places we don't want to hear. They sometimes come quietly and are not as loud as the voice of the mob and the voice of distraction and the voice of distance indifference. But those voices are there. And perhaps the saddest part about this whole story is that as all of this unfolds, the people who know best who Jesus is, the people who have spent the most time with him, the people who really know the truth, are standing off in the distance watching. That's the last verse we get. Those that know best are just standing there watching. Now there is another voice in this story. It's Jesus' voice. It's not the loudest in volume, but it is the loudest in impact because as he has taken the abuse of the mob, as he has taken the abuse of Herod, who distracts everyone from what's going on, as he's taken the abuse of Pilate, as he's taken the beating and the crucifixion, all of that, he speaks a word of forgiveness. God, forgive them for what they are doing. Forgive them for this injustice that's been heaped upon me. Forgive them for all of this, even as it's happening. That is the loudest voice in the story because God's grace is that powerful to speak forgiveness into the worst of what humans can do to one another, to speak forgiveness into this terrible injustice. Jesus' voice comes again and again in that way. It'll come in the resurrection as he comes to bring that voice alive into new life. And as we gather on Palm Sunday, Jesus' voice is always calling to us, calling us out into the world to do justice. Back when I was a high school wrestler, I had a favorite sweatshirt. I picked it up at a wrestling tournament somewhere. It had a quote from Ephesians 6.12 on it. And it was the old King James Version. It said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, which is what we really did in our wrestling matches, but we wrestle against principalities, against darkness, against evil. That is what we are called to do as the body of Christ, to be the presence of Jesus, his hands and feet and heart out in the world, fighting for justice for those who don't have it. When he stood up in the temple and said his first little sermon, he talked about good news for the poor and the oppressed. He said, this has happened today. We as the body of Christ are the ones who bring that message alive. But we have to hear Jesus' voice amidst all the other voices. We need to hear it above the voice of the mob. We need to hear it rather than be distracted. We need to hear it when we're drawn towards indifference and distance. We need to hear it when there's mocking going on. And there are ways that we listen. When we gather in worship, we hear the word read aloud, we hear it proclaimed. When we gather and discern who we are as the church, we hear the voice of Jesus. When we read scripture, when we pray, we are listening for that voice and how it speaks differently than all those other voices that we hear. When I was a wrestler, I was not particularly quick, nor was I at all strong, and I didn't have very good wrestling moves. Those three things are not very helpful. <laughs> I learned early on, and this is a lesson many of my teammates never heard. I, I could see my coaches stand at the side of the mat screaming at the top of their lungs trying to get the attention of some of my teammates and they just wouldn't hear it. But I learned early on that I needed that. Because all of those other voices that are screaming at you, they didn't know which moves I couldn't do. They didn't know which ones I could do. They didn't know what my opponent was capable of. Some of them had never been on a wrestling mat in their life. But I had these coaches, Coach Beard and others, in my corner who knew all of those things and had all this experience. So I learned early on to listen for just their voices. And they didn't have to yell. They didn't have to be loud if you were listening for it. I also learned to look 
As soon as the ref will blow the whistle and we were headed back to restart the match, I would look quick. And they, we had little shorthand signals they would give me, and I always knew what they meant because they were communicating just with me. Jesus speaks to us like that. Not always the loudest, but always the most impactful. Always calling us to grace, always speaking love into our lives against all those other voices that tear down and bring mocking and violence into the world. Now, as Coach Beard sat with me that day, that would have been around 1992, I reflected this week that it really wasn't all that much about wrestling that I looked to those coaches that were in my corner. About 20 years later, 2013, 21 years later, I was sitting this time not at the top of the set of steps in tears, but in a hospital room with my two brothers as we watched our mother die. And in the first couple of days that we're sitting there, a knock came at the door. And who do you suppose was there? Coach Peter and Coach Hamilton. Two of our coaches came because they were still in our corner. Not wrestling with the everyday stuff of wrestling wrestling, but with the stuff of life. They brought words of encouragement, and they brought cash and said, you're stuck in the hospital, go get yourself something to eat. A week later, they came back. They did not know that we had just decided to withdraw our life support and were just waiting for that final breath. And yet there they were, still in our corner. As I think about injustice in our world, I think about people who have no one in their corner. No one offering them words of encouragement. No one offering them hope. No one listening and understanding the wrestling that they have to do just to live every day. We as the body of Christ have an opportunity to be in people's corner. To go out and carry with us, not hate, not the stirring up of the mob, not indifference, not distraction, but love, grace, and forgiveness, the very things Jesus spoke from that cross. As we go out on this Palm Sunday, knowing that Jesus is in our corner all the time, speaking into our lives, may we carry that voice with us so that all people can know that God is in their corner and that we as Jesus' hearts, hands, and feet are in their corner as well. Amen.